What do you make of this pause for J&J, especially given that you yourself took the J&J vaccine? Yes, and so, you know, I think we have to, whenever we use vaccines, have to balance safety against uh, efficacy, you know, against the ability of the vaccine to prevent disease, and by preventing disease, to prevent severe infection, hospitalization, and death. And when you look at the overall balance of safety, it's very, very much in favor of vaccination. You know, we, we were talking about the rare occurrence of this uh, cerebral venous thrombosis and thrombocytopenia. And, you know, I think the FDA did exactly the right thing. They saw a cluster, or they saw six cases in women aged 18 to 48, occurring you know, roughly two weeks after, uh, between six and 13 days after vaccination. And they said, look, we're still rolling this out. Let's slow down. Let's put a pause on this. Let's look very carefully at the data. And, and that's exactly what you wanted to do. So it says some very important things. First, the, the vaccine uh, safety system, the, the system for reporting adverse uh, events from vaccination is working in the United States as it worked in Europe to slow down the or, or to have us reconsider how to use the AstraZeneca vaccine. So very important things. I think the second question, and this will come up and, and we'll get more information on it as more information becomes known about what's happening with Johnson & Johnson. If this is uh, something real that is linked to vaccination, then it may raise questions about the use of adenovirus vectors. Um, but again, it's a little too early to know. The pause for J&J, what does it mean for public confidence? It comes so uh, hot on the heels of uh, the AstraZeneca being halted as well. You know, at this point, it's really difficult to, to say anything definitive because, you know, the U.S. FDA and actually the European equivalent of, of the FDA are really looking through the data now. You know, we, we really do need to know um, what the situation is, what the real risks are. Uh, and, you know, it may be that in the end, uh, we may have to adjust the recommendation. Uh, so, for instance, that the vaccine is given to only certain people in certain age groups. But again, you know, the vaccine was tested. Uh, in very large trials, it was shown to be efficacious and safe in a single dose. It even works to some extent against the variants that are found around the world. So, you know, it's an important addition. We just, during this period in particular, where it's on emergency use, um, we really have to be careful to make sure that, the, that we can monitor uh, safety events in much larger populations. I mean, you know, in millions of people. That's going to be critical. With the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, with the AstraZeneca vaccine, it was given to 100 million people. Um, and we're tracking these uh, side effect, effects. And when we look, for instance, in the United Kingdom, they did a very, very careful study. And they looked at the risk of having to be admitted to an intensive care unit from a blood clot secondary to vaccination versus your risk of being admitted to an intensive care unit as a consequence of COVID-19. And the balance was very, very much in favor of vaccination, but there were certain age groups where the risk um, adjustment caused them to say, let's not vaccinate people with AstraZeneca vaccine below the age of 30. And again, you want to have that kind of information. And to do that, we have to look much more carefully at the data. So this story is evolving, um, and it's going to be really important to, to see and to follow up on, on what the actual safety issue is, if there is one. At the moment, with the messaging that's going on, which doesn't seem to be wholly correct here, or should I say they're not getting the right message across, you, wouldn't you agree, uh, Jerome? Uh, on top of that, I mean, this is fuel for anti-vaxxers because of that reason. And I just want to go on to ask you again to put this all into perspective. Now, how do these risks uh, compare with the risks of non-COVID vaccines or indeed the causes of blood, uh, blood clots like birth control medication as well, which can do the same thing? Yes, uh, COVID itself can be associated with blood clots. So it's a very complicated um, calculation. Um, and it's difficult to put into perspective, right? I mean, when, when we talk about, for instance, the risk of dying in an airplane accident or the risk of dying in a car accident or the lifetime risk of being struck dead by lightning, that risk is one in 140,000. That's, that's somewhere in the risk for the AstraZeneca vaccine. Right now for the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, again, really early days. We really don't have all the data, but it looks to be about one in a million. Now, additional cases may come up as we're looking harder and harder for them. 
But you know, we're uh, this is still a very rare event, and um, but we still need to collect all the information we can. Uh, with regard to other vaccines, uh, there are rare events that occur with other vaccines in the one to 100,000 uh, risk and, and range. And, and again, this is a very, very um, rare event. Um, I, I think the other way to look at it is, you know, if you prevent 100,000 COVID infections, you're preventing maybe two or 3,000 deaths. Now, they're, all, they're not all in particular age groups, and there are a lot of additional calculations that go into this. But in preventing that, you may get one case of a blood clot. And that case may be treated uh, if, it's, if it's found and diagnosed early enough. So again, it's very difficult to explain. So I think you know, it's very important as you know, people who work on vaccines that we start with the science, that we talk about the real risks, um, both to your family and, and to the country of uncontrolled uh, COVID pandemics. We know that the pandemics do a lot of things. You know, they kill people. They disrupt economies because of lockdowns and because you know we're not working at, at full speed. But also there's a biological risk. <clears throat> These uncontrolled outbreaks are the source of new variants. And so we've made tremendous progress in vaccines. It would be a horrible thing if uncontrolled pandemics allowed more mutants to appear, which then uh, decreased the power or, or made the vaccines um, irrelevant. So again, it's a balance. Sure. I think we have science still on the side of vaccination. Sorry. Jerome, you, you, you're quoted as saying this is not the place where we want to be at this stage. And I want to talk about these mutations. Last time we talked, you said that, uh, yes, certainly, but they were not, they could be dealt with with the current uh, vaccines available. Are we seeing any mutations here which are worrying you? Yeah, so I think all the mutations are potentially worrying, but it looks right now like the vaccines continue to work by and large. Uh, in prevention of severe disease uh, caused by the mutant viruses. The problem is that there are places in the world where we believe that there are large outbreaks, for instance, in Africa, uh, and we really don't have a lot of information about what mutants are circulating there. The new outbreaks in Europe and in the United States, potentially, for instance, in Michigan or in India, again, could be places where new mutants are being generated, and we don't have um, enough real-time tracking information so in, in, in other words, you know, we're hoping that these new mutants are going to be sensitive. We don't have any way of knowing that that's true until we actually isolate virus and sequence it. So again, we really, to the extent that we can, need to use the measures that we have right now, which are masks and distance, plus vaccination as rapidly as possible to get control over these outbreaks to decrease the emergence of, of resistant mutants. Right now, we think we have things under control but that situation may not last forever. Uh, Jerome, the, the, the thing is also, I mean, you can be vaccinated and still carry the COVID-19 uh, pathogen, can you not? And which, which vaccines prevent that happening? And uh, you know, what can be done about this? That's a great question. Um, because you know, vaccines often don't prevent infection they prevent disease. And actually, when they looked in these clinical trials, when we, when we give you the estimate of efficacy, it is the ability of the vaccine to prevent mild um, to moderate disease with, um, with PCR positive, so that you know, they do the nasal swab test. There are, is some evidence from the AstraZeneca vaccine and from Pfizer that they may actually decrease infections, which is important. And that's one step before being able to say it prevents transmission, which is you know, really the key. There's also evidence that if you take the Pfizer vaccine and you get infected, that the amount of virus that they find in your nose and throat is actually much lower, which again would suggest that transmission will be lower. Very important. But the fact remains, and I think we're, we're seeing cases of what we call breakthrough, people who have uh, COVID-19 infection after vaccination, and you'd predict that that would be the case. Um, we don't know how infectious people are. They may be less infectious or less trend, they, they may have a lower chance of transmitting to others. But it's for that reason that after you're vaccinated, you need to continue to wear masks and to distance, not only to protect yourself against potential infection, but very importantly, to protect others in case you do get infected. 